Hi folks, welcome to another episode of My Life with Robert Burns. Douglas McKenzie and Jim Thompson here again to chat to another of our Burnsians from uh, around the Burns world. Hi Jim. Hi Douglas, hi everybody. Tonight our guest is an international ambassador for the Burns Federation. Cronies everywhere, please welcome Sir Jeff Palmer. Thank you very much Douglas. Hi Jeff, how are you today? I'm, I'm okay. Um, in in Pentecook, it's not tropical as it was last week. <laughs> well, it, it's, it, it's, it's not tropical in Mocklin either. And uh, okay. I'm, I'm guessing Jim's got similar weather in Kilmarnock. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Pissing it down is what the locals would say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Jeff, we always start these podcasts uh, with, with a simple question. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Well, um, I was born in Jamaica uh, a long time ago, it's, uh, 1940. And um, I was born in a, a place called Monroe College District. So you can pick up the Scottish link, Monroe College yeah. District. And uh, it, it, there is a very famous school nearby, which was too posh for me to go to. Um, it's called Monroe College and it was set up by a Scot, and it is still there today. So I was born in the, in the district, and um, my mom and my father um, decided to not live in Monroe College District, which was a, a, a parish called St. Elizabeth, and they took me back to Kingston. Uh, that's the capital, and I lived in Kingston from you know, they took me back um, when I was less than one years old. Um, uh, and I lived there from 1940 until 1955, when I left to join my mother in London. Now she had migrated in 1951 and I joined her in 1955. And, um, and, and what was life like in Jamaica? before I came to London in 1955. Well, it, it was very um, uh, predictable. Everything was, um, everything went from week to week exactly the same. Uh, Monday to Friday was school. Um, uh, uh, Saturday was play and Sunday was church. And it, you, I had to go to church every Sunday. Um, and three times on a Sunday, um, morning service, Sunday school, and night service. And you couldn't miss going to church. You'd have to be sick. And of course, if I said I was sick, then I would have to take castor oil. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't really like castor oil very much. So no matter how ill I was, I, I went to um, a church. And that was very important for me because the church is where my education started. It's, it's about reading the Bible, understanding the Bible, um, um, uh, um, you know, learning about the various significant events, whether it was, you know, the crucifixion or Christmas um, or Easter. Those were very significant periods, in, in, in which I understood. Um, there was also Decision Day, you know, giving your life to Christ. And I, that terrified me. And because I said to my aunt once, well, I did it last year. Why have I got to do it again? <laughs> and, and, that, and that got me a beating <laughs> because I was being rude <laughs> and blasphemous. Um, so, but church was very important. And in Jamaica, I saw recently where they said there were more churches in Jamaica per acre than probably anywhere else in the world. Um, and, and, and that is part of the legacy of slavery and colonialism. We have a very strong church and I still support them. And just recently, the Burns Club in, in, in Aberdeen um, is now supporting my church. The same church, North Street Congregational Church, on North Street and Princess Street in Jamaica. <laughs> the Aberdeen Burns Club is 
set up a link to help educate some of the um, children. So that's my Jamaica um, background until I arrived in London in 1955. I, I, and did you, when your mother went to London, did you go to stay with, with an aunt? Yes. In fact, when she left in 1951, um, of course, she left me with her sisters. And there were, it was difficult to know how many of them they were. They could be seven, eight or nine. I was not sure. <laughs> they just seem a lot of them. <laughs> and, um, uh, they um, managed me with, a, as they called it, a rod of iron. Uh, I had to behave myself. And that was the bottom line. Um, but, you know, they uh, looked after me, fed me, clothed me, and, 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 and that's all, what you expected. And that's what they did um, until I left Jamaica in 1955. I had a wonderful grand-aunt as well called Auntie. And she was very fair-skinned. You know, but when I came to London, it was the first time I'd had realized that auntie was a lot fairer skinned than we were. <laughs> uh, 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 but it was her house. <laughs> and um, she had got that house somehow, we don't know. I, I, if I knew what I know now, I would have asked her. And when I was leaving in 1955, because nobody questioned her, my aunts did what she told them to do, auntie. And when I was leaving in 1955 to, to get the plane on my own in, 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 in Jamaica, auntie always read the newspapers. Uh, my aunt had to bring it home for her. And she called me over. And just as I was, I was dressed, you know, got my shirt on, ready to go, with my bags packed. And auntie called me over and she said, boy, take off your shirt. So I took off my shirt, you don't question what she said. I took off my shirt. And then the newspaper which she was reading, she wrapped my chest in it and tied it with string, which she had prepared because she was going to do this. And then she just told me, put back your shirt on, which I did. And, and I left. And I, I never quite, questioned or realized what that was until many years later because I had the newspaper on I got on the plane I was sweating to death <laughs> I got to New York it was freezing <laughs> and, um, and I didn't have the nerve to take the newspaper off until I got on the boat in New York and it was sailing down the Hudson River and I thought well auntie can't catch me now um, and I took it off but what it was she knew I was coming to London. She didn't calculate the time that it was 11 days. <laughs> she was wrapping me to keep me warm <laughs> in terms of when I would be in London. And to me, that is something I've never forgotten because that's about a sense of belonging. It's about people caring for you. And, and that was my life in Jamaica. The only thing I've not mentioned I, I, I learned to play cricket in Jamaica very well. And that was also a very important part of my life when I arrived in London. And without cricket, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today. Before we move on to that, one question. Did you always know that you were going to be following your, your mother? No, it, it, it was just, she, she left. I, I went to the, 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 the docks and saw her off. Um, um, and, if you live a life uh, like where, you know, you have no expectations, uh, then nothing really, you don't think of the future. Um, and she, so whatever happens, happens. I mean, my father, you notice I haven't mentioned him, but he left when I was about seven. You know, my brother would have been about three. He, he just took off to the United States, and I never saw him again. This is 1947. Yeah. I didn't see him again until 1975. Wow. I, I saw him again in New York. And that's a little story by, by itself because it was, I was then in 1975, a, a scientist working for the brewing industry. 
and I went to New York to give my first talk out of Jamaica. And it was at a conference in New York and all the, the, the sort of the senior staff or owners of the brewing industry was at that conference in New York. So Mr. Budweiser or Mr. Coors or um, from the Guinness Company, from, um, you know, what the Truman's, the, 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 the youngest brewery, stuff like that. They were all in New York to listen to me talk about barley and malt, which was my expertise then in 1975. And whilst I was speaking, I noticed that three of the biggest black guys I've ever seen walked in at the back of the hall. There were no other black person in that hall except me, because this was 1975. And the three black guys walked up from the back door up to the front of the big conference hall and sat down. And all the other, um, um, you know, the, the people attending the conference were looking at them and looking at me, but they have no idea where they were either. <laughs> and eventually I finished my talk and the three men got up and left. So I walked out after them because I knew they were there to see me. So I went out and the three of them stood there and the one in the middle said, do you know who I am? And I said, of course. And he said, who am I? I said, you're my father. And that's the first time I saw him since 1947. Wow. I, I, and, and, and how did you recognize him? Had you seen photographs? I just, I, 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 I knew what I look like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I knew, um, you know, what my mother looked like. And I, and, and since he was doing the, you know, the talking, um, I just came to the conclusion that he must be. Um, so somebody told him that I was lecturing. Yeah. And we, and we, we kept in touch. Oh, that's good. And when he died in 1985, I was in Edinburgh then lecturing. My mother, she'd not seen him from 1947 either. And she insisted I went to New York and buried him. <laughs> and that's what I did. And when I went to his funeral, um, I gave him a tie in 1975. And in 1985, he was wearing that tie in his coffin. So the life we live as descendants of, 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 of slavery and, and, of, and colonialism, this is how we express ourselves. Yeah. And that's how we express commitment, our, our association and attachment. Yeah. Um, so my aunts, I remember them all. I remember uh, my father, I remember how he left, uh, but I also remember him turning up at the, at the conference and I also remember going to his funeral and I also remember taking my mother home when she died in London because she said it was too cold here. She didn't want to be buried here. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a part of uh, the post-colonial uh, post life of, of, of people like myself. Uh, let's, let's go back to London um, and, and you're arriving there, what, as a 15-year-old? Yeah, I was 14 years and 11 months, which is critical um, because my mother didn't realize, you know, age mattered. So I arrived and, and I arrived at Liverpool on my own. I didn't know where Paddington was. <laughs> so <laughs> I walked around the street saying to some, some people I met, where is Paddington? And they said, it's in London, you've got to get a train. So I got a train. And I arrived at Paddington and, uh, uh, um, because that's where my mom was going to meet me. And uh, a woman just came up, grabbed me by the shoulder and said, come, I'm your mother. And I often joke with her about it, you know, until she passed, sadly passed away in 2003. I usually look at her and I say, are you sure you're my mother? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but she met me at Paddington, took me home in the one room in the attic in, in, in Islington. And uh, she fed me and we stayed in the one room. The next morning she woke me up and said, you're going to work, which was a great shock. 
I'd never heard the word work before. <laughs> um, and when she got, when I got dressed and she, we had breakfast, we got to the door of a, of a street, street called, I think it was Belita Villas. That's where we lived. Yeah. And uh, there was a man at the door, about quarter to eight, about like that. And the man said to my mother, is that Godfrey Palmer? Because my real name is Godfrey, it's not Jet. Yeah. <laughs> That's a story to that as well. Um, <laughs> and uh, my mother said yes. And my mo the man said to my mother, this is, I think, the 4th of March, 1955, said to my mother, um, where are you going with this young man? And my mother says, well, I'm going to work. And the man said, you can go to work, but he can't. He's not 15. Ah. So 4th of March, my birthday is the 9th of April. So I was one month short. Of, of So my mother begged and said, it, it cost me 86 pounds to bring him here. It took me from 1951 to save it. All the, the stories, the guy wasn't interested. He just said he's got to go to school. And so she had to take me to the local school um, who rejected me. They gave me a test and said I was um, educationally subnormal. Oh, wow. um, and then I was sent to another school called Shelburne Road, Secondary Modern, which is not far from the women's prison in, 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 in North London. And the headmaster was wonderful. Um, he, 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 he said, I'll take you, but not just for a month. You have to stay for the summer term. And he did not say that. I wouldn't play, I play cricket. Ah. Um, so Mr. Bullen took me for the summer term. And that's when I was playing cricket one day and the games master came up and said, have you played a lot of cricket before young man? And I said, yeah, I used to play in the park in Jamaica on a Saturday. And he said, meet me here five o'clock. And I met him there at the five o'clock and he took me for what was called a trial. And the next couple of days, he called me into his room and he said, you're now playing for London. <laughs> so he took me for a trial and I was selected. So I started playing for London School Boys Cricket Club, which only had grammar school boys. And I was in a secondary mod. And the fixture was Eaton Harrow Winchester <laughs> <laughs> and Middlesex Colts. <laughs> um, I didn't even know who the middle who Eaton was. So when I went home one after the Eaton match, my mom said, Oh, what was it like today? And I said, Oh, we played against some boys and they were so I think they were poor because they were wearing straw hats. <laughs> 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 so and, and it is that cricket where the local grammar school headmaster, Mr. King, in Islington. Read in the in the day in the um, the Islington Gazette that I was a wonderful schoolboy cricketer playing for uh, London, and this was completely unique. It never happened before from a secondary mod. And it, it, the local headmaster of the grammar school insisted that I was transferred because he needed a cricketer. <laughs> 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 and that's how I got into the grammar school. No 11 plus. <laughs> and I, that's how I got into Highbury County Grammar School. Yeah. And that started my education in terms of exams, O levels and A levels. Yeah. And I, I stayed I, there from 1955 till 1958 when I left. And, and, and which university did you go to after that? Well, I, I got a job because I didn't, my, my O levels and A's weren't good enough in terms of quality. Uh -huh. So I got a job at London University as a junior laboratory technician in 1958. Yeah. And Professor Chapman interviewed me. It was his department, <laughs> the, the biology. And he came into the room, Professor Chapman, and he said, what's your name, boy? And I said, Godfrey Henry Oliver Palmer, sir. And he said, if I can call you Jeff, you can get the job. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. 
and I've called myself Jeff ever since. <laughs> Except my poor mom, she kept saying, who's this Jeff? <laughs> but Chapman it, it, it took me in and one day he stopped me and he said, somehow I think you've got abilities and I'm going to give you a half day off to get your tidy up your A levels and O levels. And I want you out this building by 1961. And I did, I went and I got four A levels with good marks and six O levels. And I couldn't get into any university, they didn't want me. Um, and Chapman was furious and he rang up Leicester University. And that's how I got into Leicester. I didn't go in with an application form. <laughs> Um, and I went to Leicester, spent three years, I got an honours degree in botany, and I then went back to London, joined my mum to look for a job, and the only job I got was peeling potatoes in Beale's restaurant at, in Islington, and I peeled potatoes from June 1964 until December. 1964, peeling potatoes in the restaurant. And I got promoted from potato peeling to fish cook. <laughs> <laughs> First it was veg, veg maker. And then I got to fish cook and I was doing weddings. So I was doing okay uh, until I thought, you know, I'm never gonna be head chef. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I applied for a position to do an MSc in December, 1964. Yeah. And that's the fam my famous interview where one of the most powerful politicians in Britain was at the interview. And as soon as I walked in and sat down, he said, why don't you go back to where you come from and grow bananas? Oh dear. <laughs> and I then said, it was difficult to grow bananas in Harringay. <laughs> 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 and uh, that was it. That was the beginning of my politics because I've said that this was the mother country. I'm from Jamaica, which has been part of the British, English British setup since 1655. And therefore I'm going nowhere. Yeah. And I didn't get the position, <laughs> but then the life changing interview was only a few weeks later when Professor Anna McLeod and, Ed, and Harry Ward advertised for a PhD student. And I'd never been further north than Leicester. So I came, she interviewed me, told me she was a McLeod from Lewis. <laughs> um, didn't know what that meant. <laughs> um, she smoked senior service, packets of 50. <laughs> drank, <laughs> she was drinking, i sure alcohol at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and she wore a tweed suit and she was smoking away, chain smoking, and she interviewed me and it was wonderful. She was telling me about the brewing industry and the distilling industry and all that. And, I, and, and she, after 10 minutes, she stopped. <laughs> and she said, you haven't taken a word in of it. <laughs> I've said, have you? <laughs> and I said, no, I haven't, because I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Because I did botany, we didn't study Syria at Leicester University. It was an honours degree and cereals did not come into it. So she just stopped and I said, I didn't understand any of that and I didn't know about brewing or distilling. And she said, when she, she said, that's a very good point in your favour, <laughs> that you don't know anything because it means you won't bother me. <laughs> I, hate, and then she said, I hate keen people <laughs> and that's how I was taken <laughs> and she gave me a bin a dustbin full of barley and said get on with it <laughs> and I took that bin of barley and the rest is history that yeah. my, my research has changed the whole concept of how barley is, is looked at scientifically and a lot of that work was done with Anna. Um, 
and that formed my PhD. I started in 1965, January, at the Harriet Watt. Although the Harriet Watt claims me, the PhD is Edinburgh University, <laughs> because Harriet Watt couldn't give PhDs then, they were a college. Yeah. And uh, so my PhD is Edinburgh, but I worked with Anna and the professor at Edinburgh University. And um, I started in 1965, January, and I got my PhD in 1967. It took me two years. Um, and then I did a postdoc one year, and then I went and worked for the Brewers in their research institute in Surrey uh, from 1968 until 1977. And it's where I developed this process called barley abrasion. Barley abrasion. And, and as a result of that, um, many of the, the, the famous products that we, we know about nowadays have, have been developed. Well, a lot of the, it, yeah, the, the science is, I would say that the science of the, the concept is still, use worldwide. And that's the importance of science. See, my abrasion process is not still being used. It was used then between 1968, all the 70s, all the big brewers, Bass and Allied Breweries and um, Watney Truman's, they all use the process to make malt cheaper. Um, but the science is still, still applicable and um, it is taught still, but the point I'm really trying to make is my life right up until, say, I finished at the Research Institute and I came back to the Watt in 1977. So my life up until 1977 is not just my effort. It's the effort of my mother, my aunts, my grand-aunt, um, the, 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 the person who told me how to get to Paddington. It's about Mr. Bullen who took me, not for one month, but yeah. the summer term. It is for Mr. King who wanted a cricketer. Um, it's for Professor Chapman who called me Jeff because he couldn't be bothered to, Godfrey was too difficult. <laughs> and uh, also he got me to university and also Professor Anna McLeod, who took me against the odds um, and various other people. But my life up until 1977, when I came back to the Harriet Ward as a lecturer, and the wonderful, powerful story about that is, and I was retiring in 1977, Anna McLeod. And there's a hall of residence named after her now at the Harriet Ward, which she passed away. However, uh, um, I still kept in touch with Anna in 1977 when I came back. And, uh, you know, um, she got very old and she was on a stick. And I ran into her in the middle of Edinburgh one day. And, and I said, Anna, what are you doing out? You know, you're not well. I will take you home. You know, my car is not far. You stay here. And, and she grabbed me on the shoulder and she said, I want you to do me a favor, Jeffrey. And I said, okay, Anna, it was about 2000. I can't remember exactly when it was. And I said, um, no, no, I'll run you home. No, she said, I want you to do me a favor, promise me. I said, yeah. She said, I want you to write my obituary. <laughs> this is in the middle of Edinburgh. <laughs> <laughs> and so I smiled and I said, look, Anna, you'll be fine, I'll take you home. And she walked away <laughs> and came back. And then she looked me right in the eyes and she said, this is about 2000, right? She looked me in the eyes and she said, why the hell did you think I took you in 1964? <laughs> <laughs> you took me not to do any science, nothing to do about anything. It was to write her obituary, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> which I did. Very good. So that's a, the story of my life. It's not, it, it's, it's about people, good people. And that's how Burns come in, because he wrote about goodness. Well, you, you've, get, you've, you've given us the, the perfect link into, into the next stage of this, 
this episode. I'm sure we, we could listen to your, your stories no. about your life <laughs> um, I, for, for a lot longer. But um, as, as we're talking about the, my life with Robert Burns, I'll ask Jim to get you talking a bit more about your interest in Burns. Thanks. So, Jeff, I, I, I don't know what to go to God for, Jeff, now. Oh, that's no, <laughs> no, but I, just one thing before I ask the first question. Uh, I've got a love of cricket that stems from 1976. I went on holiday to, to Filey, just south of Scarborough, when the West Indies were playing England in a, a one-day international at, nice. at Scarborough. And there's an old guy from Yorkshire. I was from Scotland. I knew nothing about cricket. So I was looking for um, other kind of people with me. And, and he says, no, no, watch this. He says, he says, there's a fella here by the name of Viv Richards. He says, he's yes. just, and he says, there's a boy, Michael Holding. Michael Holding, says, yeah. And, yeah. And he says, there's this fella, Lloyd, that's a magician. He says, so just watch this and I'll explain it to you. And he did. And I fell in love with a game that I've been in love with ever since. Yeah. And, um, and I, just th I just thought that team was probably the best team I've ever seen in terms of team sport, I've got to say. That's right. um, I'm digressing. How did you no, get started? No. With, how did you get started with Bonds? Well, um, um, I when I used to be taken to church three times every Sunday, um, I also the, the school was next door to the church, and which was what we call a church school, and um, one of the main um, educational um, activity at the time was singing. <laughs> you had to sing. And we had a teacher, and I'm sure she was from Scotland, and he used to lead us in singing. So I would have been about 10, 12 years of age. And one day she got us to sing, my love is like a red, red rose. That's newly sprung in June. My love is like a melody that sweetly played in tune. Now, I sang that and I thought it was great. And also what I love about it, um, the, it, it was about bunny lasses, because <laughs> I, I knew there were girls. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I then went home and my aunt asked me what I did at school today. And I smiled and I just said, oh, we sung um, a, a lovely song. And my aunt says, okay, then sing it for us. And I start singing, my love is like a red, red rose and about my bunny lasses. And they went rigid. <laughs> they, they, one of the aunts turned to the other and said, did you hear that? He's singing about women. <laughs> and he's 10 or 12, you know? And, 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 and they said, we, we are going to have a word with the teacher. We don't want you singing songs like that. You're not a man. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my first <clears throat> contact with, 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 with Burns. It was singing um, songs. And in the end, they got used to it. I mean, we were singing um, Red, Red Rose, and we were singing um, Coming Through the Rye. And uh, that's my, my really beginning. I knew nothing about Burns um, and his life, but I liked you know, is, is, is that those two songs, which we just kept singing over and over again during singing lessons, as it was called. And, and where did that lead to with Bones? Well, <clears throat> I sort of, as I said, I left um, Jamaica in 1955. And when I came here, I did nothing about Burns when I was in London. Um, you know, and it was when I came to Scotland in 1977 that I was invited to um, uh, um, Burns Uppers in 1977. And then I started to, to take an interest because I liked, I picked up that he knew about the Caribbean. Some way I, I, I started to read. And I, I, I picked up that he, he, he was going to go to Jamaica in 1786, quite early in his, in, in his um, career as a poet. And um, I thought, well, why would Burns want to go to Jamaica in 1786? 
And then I start checking that. And then I, and, and I, I, I then <clears throat> realized that at that time, a lot of Scottish people were in Jamaica, you know, <clears throat> people like the Grants of Speyside and the Stirlings of Kerr and, um, you know, other families like the Weatherbirds and, 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 and Dundas was involved, Henry Dundas. And so the whole thing started to well together. And one of the questions I asked myself, why would Burns want to go to Jamaica? Because he was going as a, I, I, he called it himself, a slave driver. And um, I then, you know, started to give talks and I began to include, um, uh, you know, um, his work um, because when I started to look at Dundas, and a lot of people don't realize this about, about Burns's work, a lot of it is political. Um, and, it, and people have recited the poems, but not paid a lot of attention to the content. <laughs> and for example, um, he wrote, a, when you consider Henry Dundas was the most powerful politician, probably in the world, in the 1790s. And in late, yeah, 1790s. And um, Burns was at his peak in, in the 1790s, unfortunately, before he died in 1796. Now, in 1792, Henry Dundas stopped William Wilberforce from abolishing the slave trade immediately. Burns was about when that happened. That would have been news around the whole country. It was news around the world that Henry Dundas stopped Wilberforce from abolishing the slave trade by saying it should be gradually abolished. Gradually abolished. Now, Dundas, about the same time, you know, affected the transportation of the Scottish martyrs to, to Australia. During that, that 1790s period, Dundas attacked Haiti, San Domingo, and in fact, um, assisted the French, then he assisted the Blacks because he wanted to destroy the French colony of Haiti, San Domingo. Dundas sent out Lord Balcaris, Earl Balcaris, to Jamaica in the 1790s to manage Jamaica because Jamaica was the most valuable piece of land in the empire. It was providing over 50% of the income from slavery. So therefore, Burns was about at that time. And he referred to Dundas. And what did he call him? He called him Slee Dundas. Now we are discussing today about Henry Dundas and Edinburgh Council, we've just changed Dundas's plaque to put that he gradually abolished the slave trade, causing over half a million Africans to be transported into slavery because he wanted slavery to continue to provide slaves for the slave owners. Politicians and, um, and, 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 and the system, when you looked at Dundas's plaque, he was said he was the great politician, Secretary of State for War, um, Home Secretary, President of the Board of Control, that means he controlled India. But he also was a man who transported the Scottish martyrs. He destroyed um, Haiti. <laughs> he managed Jamaica. As a, as a business through Earl Barcarus. But Robert Burns called him Slee. He also called him, it's a Scottish term I don't understand, but he called him damned old Farron. Damned old Farron. That's what Burns called Dundas. And he called him that during the period 
when Dundas was at his most popular. He probably called him that before the 1790s, but he did call him that, Slee and O'Farrell. Now, Burns therefore spotted the evil in Dundas. He spotted it. And I'm sure the Scottish term Slee is probably not very nice. And I should imagine using it when Burns did. It, it, it Burns just saying, keep your eyes on him, he's dodgy. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised it'd be the late 1780s um, uh, that Burns was describing him. And, and, and he turned out to be worse than Burns described. So that's what really drew me to Burns. And I also thought, let's have a look at his other work. And when you look at the, it's a poem or song, um, uh, um, uh, old sacred, old sacred to the memory of Mrs. Oswald of Ockencrew. Now, what is that about? You know, a lot of people have read it and stuff, but it is, within it is probably one of the most powerful lines ever written of avarice. <laughs> and he was describing Mrs. Oswald of Ockencrew. Who was she? Mrs. Oswald is the wife of Richard Oswald. And who was Richard Oswald? Richard Oswald, her husband, was a friend of the Grants of Speyside, Money Musk. And the Grants of Speyside were powerful slave owners in Jamaica. And Richard Oswald got to know them in Jamaica. And the, the grants of Speyside introduced Richard Oswald to Mary Ramsey. That's Mrs. Oswald's maiden name, Mary Ramsey. And Mary Ramsey had inherited her father's slave plantations in Jamaica. So Oswald marries Mary Ramsey and she became Mrs. Oswald. Oswald and the Grants were notorious slavers. They owned an island called Barnes Island from which they bought and sold slaves. So therefore, the big house in Oakencroof is Richard Oswald's house, still there. And um, Richard Oswald dies and then Mrs. Ramsey dies. And when she died, Burns wrote that poem about her. And in that poem, he says, she was on an annuity of 10,000 glittering pounds a year, 10,000. You know, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of pounds today. She was on 10,000 glittering pounds, but the powerful line of address, he says, she had hands that took, but never gave. And that could apply to all the, the evils in the world where people have abused each other. People who had hands that took, but never gave. And therefore, um, this is my relationship with Burns. It is not about, you know, other aspects of the beauty of the poetry or the local culture. He was, he had a, a, a sharp eye on what was going on at the time. Now, he also knew the Selkirks, you know, very well. And the interesting thing, the famous Weatherburn family, um, James Weatherburn, they, and, and John Weatherburn, they went to Jamaica after Culloden. Their father was um, executed um, after Culloden. So John Weatherburn was executed and the two boys went to Jamaica and they became notorious slave owners. And um, they came back and John Weatherburn is linked to the Joseph Knight case. Um, uh, and, but that, that's John Weatherburn and James Weatherburn, he is linked to the Selkirk because his daughter married Lord Selkirk. So the daughter of a notorious slave owner, James Weatherburn, married Lord Selkirk and Burns would know that. So a lot of 
his influence about going to Jamaica was obviously based on his knowledge of what was going on in Jamaica. And that they, you know, people were changing their lifestyle in terms of financial, financially. And I think like, you know, Saul to Paul, it, he, he, he then realized, okay, his book sold the Kilmarnock edition, so he didn't go. The point is that he then realized the horror of that slavery that was going on. And he wrote, you know, um, about, about it. And he also wrote about it in The Slaves the Men yeah. uh, as well, as, as one of his, 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 his works in the 1790s. Yeah. So to me, Burns, that's also important. But there's another side where his, his, his girlfriend, Mrs. Is it McElhose, um, Clarinda, um, she went to Jamaica in the 1790s. And Burns, you know, wrote, um, 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 a, you know, um, I think it's A Fond Kiss. He, he wrote A Fond Kiss for her as a present, uh, you know, before she went to Jamaica. Um, to see her husband, who was a slave um, owner. And then she came back. So no Jamaica, no iPhone kiss, <laughs> um, because it's linked to Clorinda going to Jamaica. Yeah. It was in sweet Donegal that my foes did me enthrall for the lands of Virginia, Virginia, who a right. wonderful, wonderful song. And, and, I, I think you're right. It does show some empathy with the, the, the plight of the slave, but um, and very much a man of his time, of course. Uh, so you, you, you mentioned burn suppers. Just to, 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 have you spoken at many burn suppers? Yeah, I think um, um, it. You know, when I was a bit younger, <laughs> I'm now 81. <laughs> a lot of people. Um, keep asking me to do things, don't realize I'm just an old guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> I know exactly how you feel. <laughs> I know. Um, um, yes, I have in the past spoken at, at various burns up. I don't, a lot of people, um, you know, have probably hear me speaking about burns in non burns up situations. So if I was going to talk about Scotland, um, historical collection with slavery in the Caribbean, then I would bring Burns in. Um, so therefore, a lot of people have heard me speak about Burns. Um, um, and, you know, I use the one of the upstairs in my house. I've got a, somebody from Glasgow gave me this long framed um, statement of Burns in, um, and it's completely lined in lead. And it's about goodness mitigating woe. That his criteria of goodness um, is anything that mitigates woe. And um, so again, that's important in terms of his, his, his view, his what he thought goodness was. And, um, you know, so to me, there are all those points, but to point again is knowledge of the, the politics of the time. I'll give you an example of this, which a lot of people may not have heard. In 1782, 1782, Burns would have been a very young man. In 1782, the French decided <clears throat> they were going to take Jamaica from Britain because Jamaica was providing this solid economy. You know, in the Jamaica Street in Glasgow, do we know how old it is? It's 1763, it was built, 1763. So people were very much aware of Jamaica in, 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 in Glasgow in 1763, of its importance as an ink source of uh, supporting the economy. Now, in 1782, the French decided if they took Jamaica, they'll destabilize Britain economically. And they could have gone back and 
take America themselves. <laughs> you know, so the French helped the Americans to, to get their independence. But at the same time, they were planning to take Jamaica. The British then had to defend Jamaica. And if you speak to Royal Navy people, uh, they reckon that's more important than Trafalgar in that the British had to keep Jamaica by hook or crook, could not be lost. They could lose America. <laughs> so in April, 9th of April, 1782, the British government sent down two men to defend Jamaica. And we know their name because we know the street name. Those two men were Rodney and Hood. Admiral Rodney and Admiral Hood were sent down to Jamaica. Now, they went down and between the 7th and the 12th of April, 1782, it's a tough thing to say, but they killed and wounded 3,000 Frenchmen fighting naval battle for Jamaica. Now, Burns, in the 1790s, I'm not sure when we were 1793, about that time, Burns actually gave a toast at a dinner. And he said in that toast, it's easy to check, he said on that toast, you know, um, you know, here's to the boys we lost. In um, 1782, on the glorious battle of the saints. Burns is saying that in 1793, this happened in 1782. Uh, I'm not quoting exactly what he said, but he was saying, here's into, into the memory of the boys we lost in that battle, 1782, of such importance that it was politically and economically, Burns knew that, and was saying, you know, their names shall, you know, be always remembered. This was the sentiment of it. The boys we lost, they will be, they will be remembered. And I think that, to me, tells you that Burns was not just a, a young man walking around writing poetry. He knew the very complex politics of colonial Britain and how it was managing slavery in the Caribbean. Wow. You've done you've done you've done a lot of research, Jeff, haven't you? you... <laughs> it's it just comes naturally to me in a sense that having done barley research, <laughs> if you then see one thing, you know it's linked to another. So Burns buying his ticket or, or wanting to go to Jamaica it tells you he knew about slavery knew about what was going on. He knew the people involved. He, 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 he must have done. And therefore I decided then to look at his, his work and look at, you know, all the stuff he's written. And when you look at it, you, you, you pick up that focus about Jamaica. <laughs> because Jamaica Street would be there. Um, you know, he's born in 1759, and Jamaica Street is, was made, you know, opened in 1763. So he knew it growing up. So, you know, he, he, was, he, 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 write, he wrote lots of other stuff, you know, like, um, you know, where he, 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 he sort of charmed young ladies and, and, yeah. and, and, and write about, wrote about Scotland's freedom. But to me, the single line, she had hands that took but never gave, that's slavery, yeah. described that, in one that, line. That, that, that's very, very powerful. Yeah. Je Jeff, we're, we're kind of running out of time. We've probably okay. got about, about five minutes left. But okay. May maybe we could just finish off, you maybe tell us a little bit about your role as a, an international ambassador for the Federation. Well, you know, it was a great honour <clears throat> when 
I was approached and and and, and said that you know I was um, um, I, you know I was assigned this this role, and I I, I really thought it was a great honour. I'm not a Burns expert. <laughs> I, I just like the man because I think with a lot of great people, there is a side to them that people tend to forget or, or don't bother to study because it isn't topical. Um, and therefore I felt that what I could do is I've got very close links to, um, to Scotland in a way in fact, um, my mum's surname is Lamont. My cousins are Moat. Yeah. <laughs> my other cousins are Gladstone Wood. <laughs> and, and therefore, I have a Scottish connection. And um, I, I just did my DNA. My wife is from, you know, she's got Aberdeen descent. So she's got the Aberdeen um, sense of humour. And she brought in my DNA and she said, do you want us to read it, you know, to you? And I said, yes. And she said, you're 95% African genetically. And I said, what's the remaining 3%? And she said, do you really want to hear it? I said, yeah. She said, you're 3% Viking from Shepherd. <laughs> 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 and, um, and then she walked away with that northern humor and she said <clears throat> it explains a lot <laughs> <laughs> and therefore as <laughs> ambassador i feel that i have a, a genetic <laughs> justification and I also have a historical justification. And I also have a great admiration for a man who um, was living at a very difficult time. Um, and he managed to negotiate it and le left in his writing aspect about that period of our history, which in fact tells us more than some historians. And I, I'll never forget when I've struck upon the thing, when we're spending hours, <clears throat> great debates, all this stuff about Henry Dundas, videos being made, um, committees being disbanded, um, Dundas's family complaining, historians making up stories about Dundas being an abolitionist. Burns called him, in the 1780s, Burns called him sleep. Yeah, that <laughs> says, it, says it all. It says it all, because Dundas was dodgy. He said, God tells, told me to do this. That's why I've got to do it. He said, I know slavery is terrible, but we needed the money. And Burns just saw that, it was, uh, he, and, and Burns called him sleep because he had that sort of ambiguity about the America's independence. Uh, so Burns, when he called him sleep, would have been early, I done 1790s. So Burns knew yeah. that he was a dodgy piece of work. Yeah. And historians, to, just recently, Tom Devine is defending Dundas. I said to, to, to Devine, I said, let's forget it. You know, Burns has said it. And he, yeah. he knew him of, of the man. He was of his time. He was down the road. So that's why being ambassador um, and, 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 and being um, promoting and also defending and, um, and, and trying to get Burns's work known. Um, uh, 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 worldwide, I think it's a great honour, and um, I'm no poet, and I'm no expert, but uh, my heart is in the right place. Um, thank you very much, and and I hope you enjoy the role of ambassador for for many years to come. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Jeff, for spending some time with us, telling about telling us all about your life with Robert Burns. 
And and please remember, if you go to visit your ancestors in Shetland, make yes. sure you wear the newspaper. Uh, that's right. <laughs> in fact, actually, I did a program, a great debate recently, and we had a preamble um, with the Orkney and Shetland people because the debate was about, um, and they were the audience at this debate. And um, when I said I was, you know, 3% biking from Shetland, I've had a letter from the Shetland tourist <laughs> people inviting me anytime I want to, to, to go to, to Shetland. And I, and, and I always tell my friends, if you want to see a Viking, you're looking at one. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> thank, you. Well, thank, you, th thank you once again. Thanks for spending time with us, Jeff. And thanks, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Thank you.